Welcome everyone to Iskan of Silicon Valley. This is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. If you came into the wrong place, please stay anyway. Tonight we're going to be speaking about the tenets of bhakti yoga. It's a, the topmost level of yoga that interestingly anyone can practice from any station in life. And we'll discuss three of the most basic practices in bhakti that one can employ to lift oneself up. There's a, a description in the Bhagavad Gita about the various energies of the world and the ways that they work. Everything emanates from one divine source and everything is an energy of that divine source. So we'll discuss that and how we're also part of that. And we'll experiment with some group chanting today. There's a process for yoga that's joyful and it includes singing, playing musical instruments or clapping hands, which really can be used as a musical instrument and repeating the names of God in song. This happens to be the most effective way to advance in, in one's spiritual practice. And it can be applied in any culture, any, any time. There's no specific time that one can practice it. It can be done anywhere at any time, and it'll be effective. So we'll try that today. And later on, we'll have an opportunity to take part in a ceremony called Artik, where we'll have more of the same singing, but it'll include uh, dancing, spiritual dancing. How does that sound? Haribo. So our founder, Acharya, the one who started this movement, comes from a long line of spiritual teachers who come all the way from the beginning of creation. And his name is His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. You see him seated on this special throne called a Vyasasana. And the meaning of this is that he represents the line of teachers coming all the way from Krishna, or he represents Krishna as a representative. So just as if someone came from another country as an ambassador, the people in the host country would honor that person as if the president of, or the prime minister or the king had come from that place because that person is representing the country. So in a similar way, when we give honor to the main representative who has come to teach the process of bhakti yoga. And in every one of the ISKCON temples, ISKCON is the acronym for International Society for Krishna Consciousness, you'll find the founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada, seated on this special seat. So he came in 1965 to America and brought with him a few books and he had the intention of expanding his teachings into many books. And he also established centers where people could come together and hear the contents of those books and then take up the practices. In fact, he arranged that people could actually live in those centers. These are called ashramas, places where people could live and practice bhakti yoga 24 hours a day. And he established over 100 of those, about 108 around the world. He stayed in America from 1965 until 1977, and at which time he, he left the world. And he organized the, the ISKCON Society in such a way that it could go on 
uh, without him. So that's the idea. And the teachings would be passed down to many more. So this center has been here since 1999. And this particular uh, temple that we're in, the physical property that, that we're sitting on right now, uh, we established about uh, eight or nine years ago. And uh, we have designs here in Silicon Valley to continue to expand in many different ways, uh, various projects that are the main purpose of the International Site for Krishna Consciousness. So if you're here or if you're on Zoom watching, is there a, a Zoom window available? Let's see who's there from any other place. We welcome you. Thank you very much for coming in. And we'll start tonight with some of the chanting I mentioned. It's called Samkirtan. So kirtan means to glorify someone. And generally, in the context of bhakti yoga, it means to say something about God or to sing the names of God. And so when it's got the prefix sung, which means together, sankirtan, it means that you do it all together as a group. So this is one of the practices that the most recent incarnation of Krishna named Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu brought to light as the most important process, as I mentioned before, Samkirtan. So he showed people how to get together in their village or in their family and clap their hands. This is called kartal. You keep, it, uh, keep the beat with your hands like that. Try, see if you can do it. If you can't, don't clap during the kirtan. Just kidding. Um, and then there's some singing back and uh, there's a call and repeat. So somebody would be appointed to sing out loud and pre-microphone, they would appoint several people, sometimes up to seven people singing at the same time because you imagine you're in a very large room or in a big, big crowd or outside where there's other noises mixed in, it requires a few more people to sing. So we have microphones, so we pick one person to sing, and then you listen, and then you repeat. And just stay in the vibration and hear the, the chanting. And just notice the quality of the sound of the mantra. So about mantras. The mantra that is prominent is called the Maha Mantra means the great mantra. And sometimes it's called the great mantra for deliverance because mantra actually means to deliver the mind. And this mantra <coughs> contains three words, Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Rama. Rama. And the mantra goes like this, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare, Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Hare Rama. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama, Rama. Hare, Hare. Hare Hare. So <clears throat> before we chant the mantra, there's a couple of introductory mantras. And the reason for them is that <clears throat> to chant the mantra I just mentioned, the Maha Mantra, it's beneficial to also chant the names of those who have given the, us the mantra. So I mentioned the founder Acharya, and we start with some special prayers that recognize him as the one who brought the mantra. And also, I mentioned the most recent avatar or incarnation of Krishna named Chaitanya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we'll chant his mantra also. They're a little complicated, so you don't, uh, don't feel bad if you can't follow it. But the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you can catch on after a few times when you hear it. It's simple enough that you can follow along. And so we'll start by uh, <clears throat> looking at the screen and we can say it in unison, these mantras, just do the best you can if you don't know it, this in the next screen. And then we'll go to the Hare Krishna mantra, at which time all sing, you listen, and then you sing and all listen. Does that sound fair? And we'll start without any instruments, just, well, our clapping, we can clap. In, in time with it. And one of the 
<clears throat> tendencies uh, when you use a rhythm instrument, including your hands, is to speed up unknowingly. It happens just by degrees, and then pretty, fa pretty soon you're going too fast to enunciate the mantra. So try to stay at a nice even pace, and we'll sing together. Does that sound good? Okay. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Preshtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhara, Shivasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda. Just give me a good note. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna.
next slide. Nicely done, everybody. Bravo. It was really good. Very nice singing. And very enthusiastic dancing. So there are three stages to practice, any practice for, for that matter. But in the practice of bhakti yoga, there are three stages. But first, before I go into that, we'll talk about the importance of the first stage, which is knowing yourself. You know who you are. Because if we don't know who we are and we invest a lot of time in something we're not, then we'll have wasted it. And there's a story that I'll mention or show you the picture of if my clicker would work, but it seems to not. Or am I going backwards? Am I running it or are you? I'm doing it or you are doing it? I am? Thanks. So this is a story about a, a boy named Ned, N-E-D. Do you know Ned? No? Okay, well Ned worked really hard and he put his money in a bank account because he figured that he'd have a glorious life later. But Ned made a mistake by one number. And every time he went and put his money in his account online, he actually put it in an account that wasn't his. And he kept thinking that everything was going well in his life and that he was financially sol solid. But uh, one day when he decided to invest all his money in a business and getting a house, he went there and he noticed that he had put it in the wrong account all these days. And there was nothing in his actual account. Everything had gone to someone else. And he realized that he was broke and he didn't have any money despite how hard he worked. So this is analogous with thinking that I'm my physical body. I might work really hard for many years to take care of my body and at the end realize that actually that wasn't me. I put so much work into it, but I didn't really get anything out of it. Now that's not to say that we shouldn't take care of ourselves, but the formula given by the great teachers of bhakti is you should take care of yourself, but only in as much as you realize that the body's a vehicle for you to inquire about the purpose of life and how to attain it and ask questions about our original source, Krishna. And when we do that, then we're actually putting a real investment in a real place. So this idea of investing and getting to know oneself is called sambandha. Everyone please say. Sambanda. Sambanda means a relationship. And this is a very uh, important concept. First of all, what's my relationship with the world around me? What is my relationship with the people in my life who uh, are my relatives and so forth? Uh, <clears throat> we have... Um, <laughs> Maybe I have to start the music again. We don't, we don't have a permanent relationship with the world. It's temporary. So when I'm in this world, I may have a particular identification. For instance, what are some of the ways I can identify myself in this, uh, in this world, in this life? <laughs> you could, that's all right. Feel free to just, We'll stay focused for a few minutes. What are some of the ways that you can identify yourself, that people identify? Like, what would you say if someone said, who are you? What would you say? You'd say your name? Yeah, so let's just say your name was, you were from somewhere in South India. Possible, right? Okay, so 
let's say you were from Mangalagiri in Andhra Pradesh. So they say, who are you? And it's like, I'm an Andhra. That's who I am. And I'm an, I'm an Andhra, because that points to a particular tract of land. Or let's say someone said, who are you? And you said, I'm a New Yorker. Or I'm a Californian. Have you ever heard that? So I could identify myself as being from a particular place. That, that happens a lot. And people might say, I'm an American, and feel strongly about it. Or might some might say, I'm an Indian, or I'm, I'm Irish. And proud of it, too, because that's who I am. So this would be considered by the teachers of bhakti in the realm of sambandha to be a mistake. Because, first of all, you could change your identification with a place very easily just by getting a new passport. Sometimes people do that. They go to another country, get another passport, another identity, and then the person who is Irish says, well, now I'm Canadian. And, yes? I am who I am as well as who I want to be. Yeah, and I might have it in my mind who I want to be as well. But one of the ways that we say that is, you know, where we're from, that can change. And then also, regarding my, my identity, uh, what's another way that you might say, just in a very general way, who are you? What? Software engineer. Or you could say, I'm a man. Or you could say, I'm a woman. But that can change also. Uh, and also, uh, someone might say, I'm a cat. Like if a little cat, you ask, who are you? And the cat would say, I'm a cat. Man, can't you see? Or a dog. Dogs uh, definitely identify with being dogs. I see them when they play. They're like, I'm a dog. You're a dog. You want to play? Let's play. Let's be dogs. And what do dogs do? Mostly chase after balls. People throw them really fast, and they run as fast as they can. They grab it, and they bring it back. And then they greet people. They have a life of greeting people. When they come back, they go, <laughs> And then they fight, because they're territorial. They say, this is my territory, and so forth. But from the perspective of Sambandha, this idea that I'm a cat or I'm a dog is mistaken. Because what's actually happening is that there's a, there's a spiritual being within that body temporarily. And it's only occupying that body for a little while. And then the soul, or the living being within the body thinks that this is who I am. So that's a mistake. So if you expand that mistake, the whole material universe is not our home. No matter where you go in this world, no matter where you re relocate, it's not your home. Now that could be good news to you because the material world, if you really look at it carefully, it doesn't always work out so well for us. No matter how hard you work at the end, you get moved along, and it's not a very pleasant experience. And there's also other anomalies like disease. Anyone like disease? No? Old age? You like it? No. Um, death. How about death? No. Not so much. So that's these are problems that you have to deal with. And they're problems that are inherent in the material world that we're in now. So one of the ways that we can see that, uh, see our relationship is in relationship with this world. What is our relationship? We don't have one. It's actually a mistake. So that means that you don't have to put your heart and soul into this world, into this body. You just have to maintain it the way you'd maintain somebody, somebody's car if they loaned it to you. Have you ever had anybody loan you their car? just for an hour, and you're thinking, I hope I don't smash this car within this next hour if somebody steals it because it's on loan, then it's going to be a big problem. <laughs> so the body's like that. You just don't smash it up, take care of it, but it's not yours. You're going to give it back in an hour. That's our relationship with the body. And 
Then there's another sense of developing relationship with ha which has to do with uh, where did we come from? What's our origin? What's our source? So the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam all teach us that we all come from one source. This makes things easy. It's one-stop shopping. Janmad yataha. Everything comes from one place. Now if we analyze where that place is by logic, and if I came from there and I have certain qualities like I'm conscious, we could also reason that the source that it came from is also conscious. Would you abide in, by that? Does that make sense? So there is a, a very a detailed account of our relationship with that source. And just as we're conscious, our source is also conscious. And just as we have feelings, our source also has feelings. And just as we're people, wait for it, our source is also personal. So this is Sambandha. If we have a clear idea of what we're not and also what we are, then we get a new purpose in life. And we feel like we're not wasting our time uh, throwing um, good money after bad. Do you know that saying? Don't throw good money after bad? Well, you learn something new then. One of the ways that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the most recent incarnation of Krishna, who appeared 550 years ago, described our situation is that we're like logs floating endlessly in a river. There's no real aim to it. It just keeps floating and floating. But there's a time, he said, that it can come to the shore. So now that you're in the human form of life, you have a human body. If you're human, raise your hand. You better put your hands up. Okay. That means you have an opportunity to come to the shore, which means to reconnect with your original source, Krishna. So asking this question, who am I, is the beginning process. And then connecting. More details about our identity and how we're already connected. One is that we're particles of consciousness, They're called chitkana. And we're also a part of the complete whole. And we have a loving relationship with that complete whole. Now, if you see on the left, the sun, oftentimes this is used as an analogy because the sun is one entity, correct? Say yes. yes. I'll help you out here. Okay, so it's one entity, but it has various parts to it, correct? Yes. So there's a famous verse in a very old literature called the Vishnu Purana that, that says, Eka desha stitasyagnir jochna vishnarinirata parasya baramana shaktis yateham akilam jagat. That just as there's a sun in the universe, or just as fire, like a candle, let's make it easier, is in one place, but it diffuses its energies throughout the whole room. Just conceptualize for now that the universe is like a room, and then there's the sun, and it diffuses its energies throughout the universe, right? Same thing with a candle in a room. The point is that the fire has light and heat and those energies you can feel. So my question to you is, is the heat and light part of the fire? Is it separate or, or is it the same as fire? Heat and light, is it fire or is it separate from the fire? Same? We have a, a gentleman in the front row who says both. Let's vote again. You have several choices. It's the same, it's different, it's both. You changing, anybody changing their votes? Any abstentions? Anybody taking the minutes from this meeting here? <laughs> well, according to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it's, it's both. He said it's, it's this concept called a chintya Bed, abed tattva. So it's simultaneously one and different at the same time. 
And you can easily get your head around this. Well, not so easily because it's kind of inconceivable, but it's one and different at the same time. The sun rays, the heat that come from the sun, the photons that are emanating from the sun, they're little individual units. So they are the sun, but they're not the whole sun. They're part of the sun. So they're simultaneously one and different. So in an understanding of our relationship with Krishna, Krishna is like the sun. And we're like the photons that emanate from the sun. So we have the same quality as Krishna, but we don't have the same quantity. So we have great powers, don't we? Or at least we have some powers. What kind of powers do you all have, would you say, just from being alive? To see, that's, a, that's an amazing power. What are some other powers that you have? To what? To breathe? Yeah? Creativity, yes. You have powers of creativity. You can think stuff up and do it. So you just thought it up and I did it. That's, that's an amazing power. So what do you want to do today? I don't know. I'll think up something and I'll do it. I'll make it happen. Within your body, there's amazing powers, like your fingernails. Do they grow? How do you do that? Did you think about it? It just happens, right? How about if you, you cut yourself? Does it heal? How did you do that? I don't know. It just happened. It's one of my superpowers. I heal myself. <laughs> How'd you get better? You broke your leg. It's eight times stronger than it was before. It's like, how did you do it? Superpower. Just as we have our superpowers on a localized level, Krishna has unlimited superpowers. Just like a little ray of the sun has its quality, but the entire sun has unlimited heat and light. So Krishna is the sun and we're the little particles of the sun. And our relationship with him is that we're the part and he's the whole. He's the maintainer and we're the maintained. And whatever intelligence and ideas for creativity we get is coming from the original source, Krishna. So on one level, our relationship with him is that we're dependent. And that's not a bad thing, and I'll tell you why. Because Krishna is described in the Bhagavad Gita as suhrit. Everyone please say suhrit. It's a beautiful word. Suhrit means your best friend. Anybody here have a best friend? Wow, that's good. Right in the front row. That's heartwarming. Okay. I only saw like uh, the front row and maybe one other person. So... Maybe we should have a little socializing. <laughs> you should have a best friend somewhere. <laughs> well, let's. Uh, everybody either has a best friend, you're not telling about it, because it is a little bit personal. Or um, you know somebody has a best friend, or you can conceptualize what you think a best friend would, would be. What are some qualities of a best friend? What would a best friend be like in your life? If somebody was your very best friend, what would you say that, that they would do for you? Navina? He's got your real self-interest at, self at heart. Can you give an example of that? And please give Navina that microphone. Clay, could you pass it over for... Oh, there, okay. Ty goes to the runner. A real friend is somebody who tells you what you need to hear and not just telling you nice stuff and buttering you up, but actually telling you what you really need. What will really help you? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Let's hear what some other things a best friend will do. Brinda Sevaka. Hare Krishna, it's someone whom you can trust and open your heart. Somebody you can trust and open your heart to. Oh, that's a good one. Trust is such a precious commodity takes time to build, doesn't it? And then once you have that, it makes this bridge so you can actually open your heart to that person. You feel that you can trust them. Wow, that's good. Yes. He's always ready to help. Always ready to help. That's a always ready to help. Four words, but they're very powerful, right? Some people will help in some circumstances, but eh, maybe not now. <laughs> 
but but think about it. We say always ready to help, and then maybe there's a limit. Someone will say, well, that's my limit. I can't help you now. But what if there actually was a friend in your life who was always ready to help, no matter what you did or said or what condition you were in now? Can you think of that, what it would be like? Somebody who's always ready to help you. Okay, one more quality of a, a, be, a best friend. Oh, we got two more. We need tech support over here. Okay. He's already, always ready to care for you and always ready to help you at all times. Always ready to care for you and help you at all times. Yes. Like, I don't know, you get waylaid somewhere and in another country, in some dusty prison, nobody knows where you are. That person goes out of their way to make sure that you get out. Did you have one? They want you to succeed. They want you to succeed. So they're benevolent. They have your best interest in mind. Okay. So that sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? So there's one other hand up. I can't see who it is from here. Oh, it's Yashoda. Yeah, just... yeah, go ahead, Yashoda, and then Subhadra. Sorry. That's all right. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. So uh, the best friend for me is somebody who knows me from inside as if he or she is living in my heart always. Okay, someone who knows you from the inside as if he or she is living in your heart. Thank you. Okay, Subhadra? Also, they um, really understand you and accept you. They understand and accept you. Well, this is good. So best friend. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes that he's our suhrit, which is all of the qualities you just mentioned. Now someone might say, well, that's all well and good, but sometimes a best friend really can't do all these things for you because they don't have the power to do it. But the other thing Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is that he has unlimited powers. So what if somebody is your best friend and is also all-powerful. And your best friend says, you don't worry about anything. I'm gonna take complete care of you and you don't worry about a thing. How do you feel? Good, unless you have a little doubt there, can that friend actually help me? Because he's got his own problems. But what if it's somebody who <laughs> doesn't have any problems and has all power to help you? What a happy day, right? Someone says, I'm unlimitedly powerful. Not only that, I own everything in, in this world. And I'm willing to help you in every circumstance of your life. Anywhere you go, whatever you do, I'm always going to be there. I'm in your heart. I know who you are. I have your best interest in mind. And I'm going to help you. How would you feel then? Who said amazing? Amazing, yeah. So you should all feel amazing because... That's what our real sambandha is. We have this relationship with our source, Krishna, who has all the qualities of the best friend you just mentioned and can do something about it and always will do something about it. So cheer up, everybody. Let's see a big smile. Hey, happy, 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 happy. When I, when I used to do a daily... Uh, Parikram around Govardhan Hill. We leave early in the morning after Mangalarti can walk around the hill. When we get to Uddhavakund, then, thank you. We get to Uddhavakund, which is this beautiful little temple on the way to Radhakund, and just about that time, the sun would be coming up, and we go in for darshan of the deities, and there's an old Pujari, unfortunately, passed away during the pandemic, but I saw him there for at least 25, 30 years. And whenever I'd go in, I'd take a little charnamrita and I'd put my head down before him to get a blessing. And he'd take his hand and put it on my head and he'd say, happy, happy, happy. <laughs> and I'd walk away happy. 
So we can be happy like that because of our relationship. This is our sambandha. Now, what's my goal? This is an important question to always ask because if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. You'll just wander. So the goal is to develop a relationship with Suhrit. And it's already there, but I've gotten distracted and gone off into other types of relationships. For instance, one of my relationships is the relationship with this world. So that's compared to, let's say you come from the best family in the whole world. Anybody here come from the best family in the whole world? If you've got any relatives here, you better raise your hand. Nobody's raising their hand, okay. Let's say you come from a beautiful family, and then for some reason you just feel rebellious and you run away. And let's say you can't support yourself because you're just a kid, and you put, put a little um, few th snacks together and you run off, and then you get lost, and somebody picks you up, and then um, they don't know where you're from or where you're going to go or where you're supposed to go, so they put you in foster care, and you end up in a bad family where you get uh, mistreated in a bad family. Imagine how bad that would feel. Like you came from a really good family, but then you got lost and then misplaced and put in under the care of somebody who actually didn't care about you or who uh, was mistreating you. How would you feel then? Kind of an inane question, right? How would you feel? But I'm just trying to get a little little help here. Work with me, people. <laughs> How'd you feel? Like bad. So that's our problem. We're under foster care right now in the, the material world. It's called Durashaya. It's bad shelter, bad family, like a bad foster family that we got involved in because we kind of lost our original relationship with Suhrit. So now we're in this situation where we're in bad shelter. Now, if Kumbh Mela is starting back there, or if it's becoming like a little distracting, then there's another a playroom down the hallway. Do we have Legos? Anything in there? Can help out. So, Prayojan means to, uh, the, as the goal, is to reestablish our relationship with Suhrit with Krishna. So, the way Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who I mentioned is Krishna's avatar or his manifestation who appeared to teach us bhakti yoga 550 years ago, said we, we could think about our lives is as being gardeners. And just as the goal of a gardener is to get fruits and flowers and so forth and plant seeds and grows them, so similarly, the process of bhakti yoga is like that. We can plant the seed of bhakti in our heart by association and developing a desire to become improved, and then we can water it. And that means the practice, and that's called abhideya, or the practice. So, so far I've mentioned three things. One is relationship, the other is the goal, prayojan, and then there's a practice. So if you have these three things, those are the necessary ingredients to, to move forward and uplift yourself in life and get to a better place. Do you all agree with the premise? You don't have to. If you want to challenge it, you, you may. Okay, so the practice. Here are three bhakti yoga practices that will instantly lift you up. The first one is hearing. So. Check and see if you got a, a free pair of ears when you were born. See if they're still there. And feel a little grateful. Are they there? They were thrown in for free. And if you take a look at them in the mirror when you go home, you'll notice that they're designed quite well. Better than the, what are they called? Earbuds, ear pods? AirPods, better than AirPods. Mine don't stick in my ears that well, no matter which part I put in, no matter which fitting. But these, these ears are perfectly designed to catch sounds. There's a reason for that. 
And it's not just for survival. Human beings don't need ears just for, for survival. That's something that happens quite easily. Uh, it's something that comes to even uh, animal life. But human ears are specifically meant to hear spiritual sound. This is one of the profound statements that comes in the teachings on bhakti yoga that have been passed down. So you, you can notice that these are a special apparatus that are meant specifically to gather spiritual sound and have it go in. Now notice that there's a little entryway here. It goes inside. Where do you think it goes? Once, once the sound goes in here, where does it go? Huh? To your brain? Where else? Anywhere else it goes? Have you ever, when somebody said something to you, did you ever feel it? Did you feel it in your brain or somewhere else? Like I felt that in my brain, and now you're like, I felt it in my heart, right? You feel in your heart, you can even feel it in your gut when somebody says, I love you, and then you go like, oh my God, I just felt it right here. It's just, that just, uh, now I'm happy, right? Uh, three words. So there's, uh, there's a way in which we're very perceptive. We can also understand subtle concepts as human beings. Now that's, somebody said brain. Uh, we, we have an uncanny way of understanding aesthetics. For instance, poetry. I've noticed lately a, a lot of videos of animals listening to music. Have you ever noticed that? They listen and they're, they're trying. Even some dogs, they'll try to play the piano. They're like, wow. <laughs> Living entities. They, they like the, the energies of the world. But human beings can actually take those in and appreciate that that's beautiful. That's, that's something lovely, and it, it, it's indicating something. It's indicating something beyond just the mechanics of the material world. There's something more to me in aesthetic beauty. Why do human beings have parks, for instance? What's the use of a park? It's not that efficient. Like Washington Park in Burlingame. I have to say, it's one of the most well-maintained parks I've ever seen. Of course, I see it every day because I go there, but they're always fixing something, planting new trees, taking down old ones, making everything really nice. But what's the actual economic benefit of a park? Huh? It's a lot of used space. Why don't we put apartments there? What do you think? Why don't we bulldoze the whole thing, put it in a parking lot? Wouldn't that be nicer? It's more efficient. Well, you wouldn't say no or ca even care if you weren't a non-material being that had a sense of aesthetics where you think like, no, I want to park. If it was all just efficiency, you'd think, no, take paradise and put up a parking lot. You guys don't go back that far. <laughs> Joni Mitchell. Okay, so take paradise, put up a parking lot. So the idea is we're feeling, we have these sensitivities for beauty, for love. We want that. That's the main thing. It's not mechanics. And we can perceive that through our ears, especially. There's, there's music, there's rhythm, there's spiritual sound. And we experimented with it at the beginning. This was our introduction to spiritual sound, this chanting. We just clapped our hands. Did anybody feel anything during the chanting? One person? How did you feel? <laughs> well, what did it feel like? Heavy? Happy, felt happy, felt uplifted. So when you take in spiritual sound, it goes in your ears, goes in your heart, and from the inside out, it starts to transform your whole existence. So hearing is very powerful. Now, what if you hear sounds that are about um, gratuitous violence? How would you feel? I didn't even like bringing it up. You get an anxiety. I mean, there's a lot of sounds nowadays that are actually meant to put us in anxiety. People collect them all. What, what are the most anxiety-ridden uh, sounds we can possibly uh, write down? And by the way, writing is just an abstraction of speech. So when we talk about hearing, you know, when it's written down also, you just abstract speech, put it down, and then you're hearing it also. And there are genres that are just meant to make you feel uh, like the world's falling apart and, and you want to be, you feel helpless, you want to read more about it somehow. 
oddly. And there are other kinds of sound vibration that are meant to make you feel more desirous, like desirous of buying something. Have you ever heard a sound vibration that was meant to, that was created to induce you to buy something? You better say yes, because <laughs> if you grew up in the world, there's signs all over the place saying, you know, buy this, buy that. And, they, and there's subtleties in it, like ideas, if you buy it, then you'll look better. Or if you don't buy it, then you're going to look worse. Or you're going to suffer somehow or other. These are sound vibrations also, right? So there's lots to hear. So in the practice of bhakti yoga, we're more particular about what we hear. And there are specific vibrations that are spiritual. And when you listen to them, what happens is it goes in your ear, into your heart, and then it starts to wake up that relationship that you have with suhrit. You can actually realize the relationship directly just by hearing. Is that amazing? Say yes. yes. That is amazing. Then what do you do? So it's natural to chant. When you feel something, then you want to talk about it. You'll write a letter and say, hey, this just happened. No, you'd write an email. And then uh, you'd tell people about it, and you'd repeat it back. And that's called kirtanam, or chanting. And we talked about that. And then the third thing that happens when you hear and then you chant, then you remember. And when you remember the original source of everything, who's your friend, who owns everything, this is called Krishna consciousness. When you look somewhere like at the ocean, have you ever seen the ocean? Did you like it? I love seeing the ocean. You drive over the, what is it, the 92? Not, yeah, that goes over the hill. When you're going down the 380, take a left and right then left. Rope swing over the alligator pit. No, there's, there's a road that comes over the hill towards um, Pacifica. And uh, once you get to the top, you come down, you see the, the ocean. And there's this sense of awe. The ocean. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that of bodies of water, I'm the ocean. So when you see that, and you can remember Krishna, your friend. And how about the light of the sun? Do you like that? Yes. Do you ever go to Hawaii? Yes. Why? Because there's more sun. <laughs> there's sunshine there and the ocean. So we gravitate to those places that uh, give us joy. And where is that coming from? Krishna. So in Krishna consciousness, we see the world in a different way. It's all reminding us of our relationships with Suhrit, and we remember him over and over again. And more we remember Krishna, the happier we become. And that's the only real rule Krishna gives in the Bhagavad Gita if you want to be happy. You want to hear what the rule is? Sorry, ran out of time. We'll tell you next week. <laughs> see you later. Thanks for coming. The only rule is that you have to remember Krishna. That's the only thing Krishna says. He says, just remember me. And if you remember Krishna, do that one thing, then you'll always be happy. And you'll always be in a pure state as well. And how do you remember Krishna? Like, can you practice it? Say yes. Because that's what we're talking about now, is practice. So how do you do it? Hear and chant. Then you will... Okay, if it was an SAT, what's the highest level you can get? Ask Balaram, I think he got it. What is it? One, 1,600 for everybody. 1,600 on the SAT for all my friends here, because you got this right. Hear, chant, even if it was a fluke or you cheated. Hear, chant, and? 1,600, everybody. So that's all you have to do to be happy, and that's the practice of bhakti yoga. Hear, chant, and remember. And you can... Play with the ratio of how happy you want to be. Like on a scale of 10, 1 to 10, and 10 means happy, uh, so happy you're bursting. Uh, at the, you're, you're ready to come out of yourself because you're so happy. And 1 means you're morose and sad and depressed. Where would you like to be on that level of 1 to 10? 10? Anybody wants to be at 5? Don't you miss being de depressed sometimes? No? <laughs> okay. Then you decide how you want to adjust these three. So there's hearing, chanting, and remembering, and you can decide. There's a little dial there, and you say, like, okay, I want to be at about a five. I'd like to actually be depressed sometimes 
and feel really bad about myself and about the world and kind of hate people and be in anxiety. So I don't want to do the hearing and chanting thing too much. Because if I move up a little more, I'm going to get happier. And I don't want to be happy. Could, might somebody say that? No? <laughs> OK. So if you want to be happy all the time and be at a 10, then just turn the knob up. And how would you do that? You hear and you chant more. And make that part of your life. Let the sound vibration go in your ear, into your heart. And then you talk about it, or you sing about it. And then you're going to remember Krishna, and then you'll be happy. The end. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. I think that is the end. OK, there's extra tips. This is bonus. So get into a routine. If you want to make this happen, you have to have a routine. So neurons that fire together, wire together. Everyone say, neurons that. Yeah, so you have to practice until you feel like the neurons are helping you in your head. And means that f find out what the ideal day looks like, or at least how to start your day in the ideal way and how to get a practice going. And you can ask anybody who's an experienced bhakti yogi, how can I build a routine so that I can be closest, as close as possible to the hearing and the chanting and the remembering? and they'll teach you how to do it. And then do it consistently until it becomes a routine, and that's what you do. And the next is to make at least three improvements each month. So you gotta write them down. Does everyone have a place to write something down at home? So could you write down three improvements you wanna make next month, which conveniently starts when? Tomorrow? Yeah, you wanna make, the August, you want to make three improvements in August, right? Say yes. yes. So can you do this for homework and write down three things you want to make better? Yes. And I suggest that you figure out how to make your spiritual practice a little better and make those three commitments. And then do it for September, October, November, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Okay? Yes. Say yes. yes. And um, the third is to get a good start every day, just like in, in racing. Has anybody ever run a race? You have to get a good start, right? And people practice their starts all the time, like jump out, just when the, the, the gun goes, and then choom. if you get a slow start, it's, it's harder to catch up. So if you learn how to get a good start in your day every day, then you're going to get momentum throughout the day. This is a, a, an ancient yogi trick. So yogis, they're so into this that they get up early in the morning. Who likes to get up early in the morning? That's good. You can get a good start early in the morning. And the way you, go, you can get up early in the morning is go to bed early at night and plan ahead. Get yourself a system so you know you can wake up. And when you get up, have a routine that you're going to follow right when you wake up, even if it's just for five minutes or one minute. Get a one-minute routine when you wake up that's, uh, that includes hearing and because then you'll three parts. That's all you got to do. And once, once you do that, you get a good start, even if it's for one minute in the morning. You get your routine down. Then you beat the mind off the block. See, it's a race. The mind's sitting next to you. you. Start the race. Gun goes off. If the gun, if the mind gets ahead of you, you're in trouble. You be ahead of your mind. You say, "I'm going to beat him off the blocks and win the race against my mind." So start early, and you'll be ahead of the mind, and you'll be able to have momentum throughout your day in your practice. Okay. Here's some more homework. Oh. On your piece of paper, I want you to get. Um, four separate pieces of paper when you get home. Are you listening? Yes. You're really paying attention, right? Okay, four pieces of paper. On one of them, make your three-month goals. Another one, make a one year, all your one-year goals, three-year goals, and your lifetime goals. You have that? Take two minutes for each page. And don't, don't 
dwell on it, just write down as many things as you can think of, because it's a profile to see what your ambitions are. And after you do this, and you can go back and refine it, but let it be stream, stream of consciousness. Don't second guess yourself. Just write down everything you're thinking. Two minutes for each page, four pages, three months, one year, three year, and lifetime. And then uh, you'll have that piece of paper. And in two weeks, we'll go over it, or maybe three, <laughs> when we come back together. Thanks, everybody. We'll take two reflections. So whoever makes a reflection, it better be good. Just kidding. Go ahead. Anything you heard that you're taking with you? Yes. Uh, thank you for the nice class. Actually, uh, a lot of good things, but uh, I'd like to mention about um, the three points you mentioned, which is getting into a routine. Then Getting into a routine, yes, that's yeah, helps. It's very important. I can see it through my kind of personal day how it goes. If it's not in the routine, then <laughs> the whole day kind of becomes messy. And then making at least three improvements each month. Um, you know, this is something kind of new <laughs> for me. I mean, yep, three improvements. I haven't thought like monthly-wise, so this is a very good initiative, I think. And... I think getting a good study, which you already mentioned. Yeah, so I uh, just wanted to say, and also like setting goals, uh, three months, one year, three year lifetime, I think that's amazing because then I can set the goals in a way where I can know what is my short-term goal and what is long-term goal. So thank you very much. You covered a lot. Let's give them a hand. I think Prabhu covered so much that we could move on to our final chanting because those are really good reflections. So now we're going to chant with a little um, music, a little raga. And now everything that you know about relationship, yes. Yes, you may, please. What is your advice for dealing with this? Oh, sorry. Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question. So what is your advice for dealing with disappointments along your spiritual path with your progress or your routines or your practices? You know, when How to deal with disappointments? Yeah. Can you give me an example of a disappointment? Um, you know, like sometimes my practice is strong, I'm feeling good, and sometimes my practice is not so strong. So then I get disappointed, and then it's, and then it's kind of, you know, that's not a good state of mind. Okay, my suggestion is... Read autobiographies of successful people and find out if they had any disappointments. And you'll find out that every successful person had more disappointments than most people because they tried more things and they tried harder. And whenever you try in this world, there's always going to be a refinement period during which you're not going to live up to the mark. And if you're making progress in anything, there's got to be a disappointment to actually impel you to go further, compel you, that, that like, I want to do better the next time. That's one thing, is look at the lives of, of people who have successfully attained anything and notice that they've gone through disappointments. And from that perspective, you'll see disappointment's not bad. It just means that uh, there's another way around it and to keep practicing until it works. The other thing is to get good association, because when we have association with others, it's like in the old days when people used to get all their heat and light from fire. They didn't have electricity. And they keep a stove and they always keep it burning because it's hard to start fires when they didn't have matches either. So they'd have to rub sticks together and have a little tinder box. So if somebody's stove would go out in the old days, they would take this little tin box to a neighbor and they would say, excuse me, do you have any coals, burning coals in your stove right now. And they say, yes, let me give you one. And they pick one out with these tongs and they put it in your steel box and then you take it home and put it back in your stove and then put some more tinder on top of it and poof. Uh, I mean, that's not the right word. What's the right uh, sound effect for a, a fire starting? Like combusting all of a sudden. What is it? I don't think that's right either, but I'll work on it. I need help with my sound effects if there's any coaches out there. So the fire would start. and You went to somebody else, and you got their fire. So association is very helpful, too, because 
in sports, in politics, in um, academics. You always have to have mentors that are going to help you. And in spiritual practice, the same thing too. You need a coach. You need a whole team of coaches, actually, if you want to excel. So there's this system in Gaudiya Vaishnavism where you collect mentors. They call them gurus. You get a head, head coach, then you get a bunch of other coaches to help you in all different parts of your life. And coach, I'm disappointed. What should I do now? Listen, you're doing great. I've watched you. you, you know, you're doing better than you think. So we need to hear that. So those are a couple ways that you can overcome disappointment. And if you're not getting disappointed, probably means you're not trying hard enough. I have a quick follow up to that. I yes? like what you said about the autobiographies. I think in terms of like regular material success, like I, there's a, so many autobiographies. The ones that I've read spiritually, it's, it is like a hole that's like missing in my mind because I read these stories about saints, but they're already like realized, you know what I mean? Like I don't... Prabhupada had a lot of problems, a lot of disappointments. If you read his autobiography, autobiography his biography, you'll find that he, he first, he wanted to, to do something, but he couldn't because he had family life, he already had kids he had to take care of, he had a job he had to take care of. And it took him a long time before he could actually do what he wanted. And then when he got to that point, there were a lot of setbacks, a lot. Mm. I mean, once he got uh, gored by a cow with long horns, it's, it's very dangerous, actually. You go near cows, sometimes they swing their head when you're not looking. And if they hit you with their horns, you can be mortally wounded. And that happened to Prabhupada, not mortally, but he was injured very badly. And it was right after he took sannyas, and he was thinking, what's this? And then... He, he lost all his money. He thought he was going to make a lot of money in business and use it to spread Christian consciousness. He lost everything. Some employee messed up and it all got taken away. So the one thing after another, disappointments in Prophet's life, that's one of the reasons people like to read the story. Nobody likes a story where it was, it was a clear, beautiful day. <laughs> everything worked out. You turn the page. It was another clear, beautiful day and everything worked out. And you keep turning the page like... Psh, you want to hear what happened, like, <laughs> how, did they, how did they get out of it? Like, I want to get out of it. And so you can read the, the story of Prabhupada. Thank you, I appreciate No, thank that. you. No, I, really I, good questions. I've read the lectures, but you're right. I actually don't know anything about, like... Get her a Lilamrita, who's... Okay, he's on it. He's going to get you a Lilamrita. Oh. Afterwards, I'll sponsor it for you. Oh, thank you. Haribo. Okay, thank now you. we're going to chant. Hare Krishna. we got thank you for two minutes. Uh, China tune. Here we go. Two, three, four. Hare Krishna, Hare
dance parties like you've never had before. You can let loose and dance. Uh, we're going to put away these seats in the, in the back, pile them up. We're going to roll up this carpet and open up this supreme dance floor. This is special wood just made for Hare Krishna dancing, so feel free to let loose. Thank you very much, everybody. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. Hare. Downbeat. Anybody else? Namah Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Prachanine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatyadeshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda
little louder. Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama.
Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Badad Hare Shiva Sri Gaur Bhakta Vindiki Jai Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopopina Shamakun Radhakun Giri Govardhan Ki Jai Sri Vrindavan Nam Ki Jai Sri Mayapur Nam Diptan Ki Jai Sri Jagannath Puri Dham Ki Jai Tulsi Devi Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Jamuda Devi Ganga Devi Ki Jai Sammeta Bhakti Vrindi Ki Jai all glory is to the assembled devotees. All glory is to the assembled devotees. All glory is to the assembled devotees. Go or pray, Manandi Hari Hari Bo.
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू द संडे फीस्ट फेस्टिवल हियर एट इस्कॉन ऑफ सनिकन वैली थैंक यू फॉर you know uh, spending your valuable time and coming here at iskon of silicon valley we thank all the devotees who have joined us online also so let's give a big round of applause to everyone <laughs> today's topic of discussion was the stages of bhakti yoga brought to us by his grace vaishishika prabhu so let's give him a big round of applause and thank him for this wonderful class hari krishna we will also like to thank him for the ecstatic aarti so we we'll like to thank monisha for the narsimha aarti so if you have missed any part of the program we uh, record this and it's available on the facebook youtube please do watch us and uh, you know and this is all brought to us by the expert leadership of ramananda sakha prabhu the technological team and let's express a big round of applause for them and thank them the giridhar prabhu and the charunimai prabhu are working under the leadership of ramananda sakha prabhu so let's thank them all so today we have two sponsors for the sunday feast festival the first one is sundaran prabhu and vishaka mata ji are sponsoring on the occasion of raja's birthday is she here raja please come how old are you now i am 8 you are 8 and what 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 did your brother give you the gift uh he didn't really give me a gift but he's making pizza so that's kind of a gift ah. I know there is one more gift is waiting so I don't I don't want to you know break the surprise but you'll get soon sometime okay Hare Krishna just just wait wait here and do you like to come to Iskon of Silicon Valley yes and what do you like the most I like uh to I like to attend kirtan and do aarti oh very nice thank you raja here is a prasad okay thank you Hare Krishna. And the next is a special sponsorship by Kunti Mata Ji is sponsoring on the occasion of the passing away of her pet. Uh, his name was Hari Das, and that's a cat, right? Mata Ji, yeah, please do come and uh, please collect the Mahaprasad. And if you like to say a few words, you can say a few words. would like to show the picture of the cat oh, that's my hari das oh, no. <laughs> please pray so he is born in the vaishnava family <laughs> i think that's all for the announcements and uh, i want to call on the cook 
Hey Krishna, today we have an extra special feast um, with a long list of cooks. So today's prasadam was cooked by Krishangi Gopi Mataji, Aruni Mataji, Bageshri Mataji, Bharati Mataji, Bhaktivatsal Prabhu, Charunamai Prabhu, Munmun Mataji, Preeti Mataji, Sumadura Mataji, Sonia Mataji, Trilokani Mataji, Vishalvanoth Prabhu. And for the youth, we have Advait. Advaita, Abhijit, Anushri, Gora, Kaylee, Kunja Kumari, Manisha, Niharika, Parth, Sadhu Vrindavan, Shastra Sara Prad, Vrindaranya, and Vedan. And here they are, and we're going to hear more about the process from Manisha. Hey, Krishna, there's a lot of youth. Um, all of these youth have been cooking since the morning, some of them since like 9 a.m. Um, and I'll just pass it on to them because I think there's a lot more realizations from them. Um, yeah, so we woke up and started cooking and one thing we learned is that there's a lot, actually a lot more that goes on behind the scenes than you see because um, sometimes we complain about simple prashadam when that's being served, but it's actually not so simple because... Um, like so many devotees, like skip out on lecture and go to the kitchen to sacrifice and put in work for the prasadam for the devotees. And I think we've gotten a lot more grateful from this experience. Um, on the teamwork aspect of it, it was really fun to just work together with all the youth. I think it was one of the best bonding experiences, like serving together. And um, I think that we also started off with the prayer that we would have the right mood and do it in a service attitude. So setting the tone always helps. And I think we were able to carry that. And we hope that all of you enjoyed the feast. <laughs> Um, Hare Krishna. So I think this is also a very great experience, especially because um, as a youth, we're the next generation of like cookers. So, like we've got to get experience to it now <laughs> for the like the future generations. And um, I think like as mentioned, it was also a great bonding experience and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that it's really cool to cook an entire meal from scratch because when you're eating, you only see the final product. But when you're cooking, you get to see all of the little steps that go into every dish. Like for example, today we have samosa and actually making samosa from scratch is so hard. Like we rolled up the dough into little bits and then had to roll the actual bits and that takes so much actual manual energy which I never realized when I was just eating a samosa. And then you have to perfectly like assemble it and roll the edges. Um, and so it's just a lot of tiny steps that have a lot of love put into every step. And so what you're eating has taken a lot of energy out of everybody. And it's just something I realized when making it. All right, Krishna. Um, I'll admit towards the beginning, we were a little bit disorganized. It was chaotic. We didn't know what was going on. We were yelling. But as, you know, as we progressed, as more time went on, we like, turned into a well-oiled machine. There's different stations doing different things. We had one room chopping vegetables. Then we had the next room receiving those vegetables, spreading it out wherever it needs to go. We had you know, one room or one table rolling out dough, one table taking care of um, the cooking part or the part near the fire, one table or one you know, team taking care of baking things. And it was all going in a circle. So it was like a little, you know, uh, machine, yeah. Assembly line, that's the word, yeah. And so we were slowly assembling it, and then it ca came to the finished project, product. But it was a great experience. Hi, hey Krishna. So when I was on the car ride here, I was thinking that the menu we were trying to make is a little bit ambitious because a lot of us haven't cooked in, the, in like a, big, a kitchen like this in, um, in a while or even ever. But after... After coming there, everyone had such great enthusiasm, and we all worked together in different groups. And then with the guidance of Krishangi Mataji, we successfully um, got our goal. 
Um, I just want to add His Grace Bak the Vetzel Prabhu was with us too. Um, and he helped a lot with every single step of the way. We learned a couple of new tricks actually that if you um, dip your hand in water and then you're touching dough, it's not gonna, it won't stick to your hand, especially like something that's buttery. Um, it might seem like a common sense to a lot of you expert cooks out there, but for us, it was a lifesaver. And so a lot of small tips like that really helped us like understand it takes years and experience um, years to get this experience to cook for such a huge assembly of devotees. And I think we're all just very grateful to have been under such great guidance of uh, all the devotees here and His Grace by Shishikar Prabhu and um, all, literally everyone here. Um, so a huge thank you to all of you. So we'll go to Prashad Priest, Seva Priest now. Is ordinary ingredients that become extraordinary because they're offered to Krishna with love and devotion, as you just heard. Love is expressed through hard work, some sacrifice, as the devotees just expressed when they were telling about the process of cooking. And while cooking, the devotees are thinking that this is for Krishna to satisfy him. And when Krishna is offered the prasad, or the boga, the food, then he glances at it, he eats through his glance, and then what's left is called Krishna prasadam. And this song is about the power of Krishna prasadam. Nobody in this world has the power to control their senses. Sooner or later the senses take over, drag us down into anger, greed, lust, and so forth. But Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that when you honor Krishna Prasadam, you're able to conquer the tongue, which is the gateway to all the other senses. And then what takes yogis thousands of years to attain, and then their result is tenuous at best, one can attain by taking Prasadam, and it becomes permanent because it changes the heart. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur here calls out to glorify this process of taking Krishna prasadam and invites us to sing this song. Shari Rajya
please come take your shot. Um, just outside, you'll find a picnic area, and prasadam will be served just out there. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.